Chapter 3 Initiation The year I turned ten my Aunt Maria, my father's sister, called my mother and convinced her to go to a tarot card reading. For some reason, my mom brought me along, perhaps as moral support for this venture into the unknown. We turned down a side street near Tremont Avenue, stopping in front of a white two-story house situated close to the curb. A buzzing neon sign in the front window read tarot card. Readings. Inside, beyond a small sitting area with a few chairs, I saw a curtain hanging over a door that led to a back room. That must be where they do the readings, I guessed, and sure enough within a few minutes the lady of the house came through the curtain doorway, gesturing for us to follow her back. This is my sister-in-law Esther and her son John, Aunt Maria told the woman, who eyed my mother and me for a few seconds, then nodded and told Aunt Maria to sit at the card table set up in the back room. A white cloth covered the card table, and I saw candlesticks, crosses, figurines of Catholic saints, and other holy items spread across another longer table against the back wall of the room. Right away the woman, Cookie, gave Aunt Maria a card reading, and as she muttered out what she read in the cards, I glanced at my aunt's face. No one from our immediate family knew she had been involved in witchcraft since childhood somehow she'd kept it a secret but even now as I watched her, I saw a gleam in her eyes that hinted at a restrained power behind her bland exterior. When Cookie finished she asked my mother if she would be interested. Mom hesitated, but Aunt Maria convinced her so my mother agreed, afraid to say no and disappoint her sister-in-law. During my mother's reading, Cookie told her nothing but negative things. I couldn't believe the words coming out of her mouth. Your husband is a womanizer, she said, studying the cards on the table. You have a very bad marriage, and I see you being a widow at a young age. I glanced at Mommy. Her face wore a blank expression, and I knew it was because the card reader's words had found their mark. She went on for a few minutes, loading my mother up with misery. The next thing she said was about me. Your son is on the verge of losing his sight. She stopped suddenly, studied the cards a bit longer, and lifted her diabolical gaze toward me. This boy needs a ceremonial cleansing right away. If he doesn't receive the cleansing I see him losing his eyesight within 30 days. She turned her hard eyes back to my mother. The ceremony will cost $200 don't delay. By now my mother was in a panic. Beads of perspiration dotted her pretty forehead, and my stomach roiled with anger that one more thing just got added to her already heavy load of worries. She promised the card reader we would return within a week for my cleansing ceremony. As we left the card reader's house that day, little did my mother know that an evil door had just been opened, and we were about to walk through it. Welcome to witchcraft. I knew my mom didn't have $200, and the idea of asking my father for the money was a joke. So she did what any good mother would do she sold her bedroom set to a neighbor for $250. A week later my mother took me back to the tarot card reader, who was a high priestess and medium in an occult religion called Santeria. Leaving my mother in the front sitting area, Cookie led me back to the kitchen where she initiated the cleansing ceremony by placing beads of different colors on the table each strand representing one of the five main spirit gods that ruled the religion. In the kitchen, I sat and talked with her until someone from behind me tied a blindfold around my eyes and led me to a room where together they tore off my clothes and bathed me with herbs and plants. Terrified, 
I shook with fear but kept silent. Why couldn't my mother be with me during this? Strange ritual that was both frightening and humiliating? I had no idea what would happen next. Suddenly the high priestess and her helper started singing songs to the five main gods of Santeria, Obatela, Yemea, Akan, Chango, and Oya. Although I couldn't see because of the blindfold, I knew that two people performed the ceremony. Some time later they dressed me in white and took me to another room where I was offered up to the five gods. When they finished singing, I was given five beaded necklaces to wear, each representing the color of a particular god. They told me to bow down in a certain fashion, repeat the names of the five main gods, and thank the gods for receiving me. During the process the two women became my godmothers in Santeria. They wrapped my head in a white bandana and told me I must stay dressed in white for seven days. Finally they released me back to my mother, but I would never be the same innocent ten-year-old boy again. The world of Santeria had become real to me. My life would be controlled by the guardian spirits that rule over Espiritismo and Santeria. I would no longer belong to my mother but to incredible forces beyond my control, for these entities had stepped up to fill the void in my heart that yearned for a father. After this, every weekend one of my godmothers took me to what they called Centros Espiritismo churches, to learn how to work the Mesa Blanca. I learned from the very best, people dedicated to Santeria and Espiritismo for 30, 40, 50 years of their lives. They called themselves mediums. As I made my weekly visits to the Centros, I learned how to communicate with spiritual forces of different ranks, cast spells, and recruit others into the religion spirits that I now realized were diabolical spirits, or demons. School for Warlocks Centro was a place where humanity met the supernatural in a most diabolical way, a place where I went to school to learn how to lend my body to evil spirits to be demon-possessed. We met at Cookie's house in a large room on the first floor. About 60 people gathered in rows of folding chairs set up facing the Mesa Blanca. Aunt Maria took me there for the first time on a Friday night. As I walked inside the room, my eyes adjusting to the dim glow of candlelight, I felt chills run up and down my spine. Something in the atmosphere told me this was not a regular meeting. People stood in clusters talking before the service, but they took their seats when the six mediums assumed their place at the white table. Glancing around, I saw that I was easily the youngest one there, so I sat somewhere in the middle, trying to lose myself among the older people. But there was no chance I'd be lost that night. We have a special guest tonight, Cookie said as she called the service to order, dressed all in white. He's a new initiate in the religion. John, would you come up here please? She held out her hand toward me, a motherly expression on her face, and I couldn't refuse in front of all those staring adults. I walked to the front and Cookie sat me on the edge of the Mesa Blanca so I could watch, listen, and learn as the mediums worked the table. No lights were allowed, because demon spirits only come down when it's dark, as Aunt Maria had told me before. The service started about 9 p.m. I had no idea that first time it would last. Until 5 o'clock in the morning. One by one the mediums performed cleansings, gave readings, and prophesied over those in the folding chairs who had come for healing or guidance or deliverance. From spells. Focus and watch what we're doing. Cookie whispered to me. 
I nodded, instinctively aware that I should remain silent. Permission of the white table, she suddenly intoned. I see. And. She called out what she saw in the large vase full of water in the center of the table, encircled by. Candles. The spirits showed her and the other medium certain things in the water, or in their. Mind slash conscience, and they would call those things out, addressing the person the prophecy pertained. 2. In time I grew bold enough to start speaking out things I saw in the water too, or the different vibes. And spirit voices hovering over the table. The mediums would target individuals in the audience, placing a glass of water and a candle. Behind their chair. Permission of the white table, I see this lady who lives in your house pale white. Skin, jet black hair, and she's put a spell on your family. Now we're going to break that spell, one. Of the medium said. The woman in the chair shook visibly, tears spilling down her cheeks. As the medium continued prophesying over the woman, he prepared himself to catch the demon that was casting the spell over the family, entrapping it in his body. Suddenly the medium started yelling like a madman, foaming at the mouth. His eyes rolled back in his head, showing only the whites, and he practically floated in the air before grabbing the victim by the throat. The other five mediums around the table got up and started to pray Hail Mary. Full of grace. Throwing holy water on the medium in the chair. One medium grabbed a cross in her hand and confronted the demon trapped in the medium's body. Every time a spray of holy water hit the medium, his body jerked and contorted. By this point, I could see that the medium was in a trance no longer himself but something diabolical. Don't hit me. Leave me alone, he screamed in the guttural voice of the trapped spirit. Finally, he fell back as if dead, growling and making weird noises as the other mediums drove the demon spirit back to hell. Permission of the white table, Cookie called out one night, directing her dark eyes toward me. I see one of the most powerful guardian spirits in all Espiritismo guiding and protecting you. John. Her words hung in the air as I waited for what would come next. He is an Indian chief spirit. Named Tawada, she added, and at that moment I remembered the Indian necklace that had dropped out of the sky when I was younger. Amazed, after that I prayed to this special new deity my protective spirit daily, even moment by moment. At another gathering one night, the intensity of the service reached an electrifying pitch, and I felt pulled to keep glancing at the six-year-old girl who'd been brought there by her mother. My sharpened spiritual senses picked up an evil vibe in the same instant the mediums at the white table shouted, Focus, focus. There's a bad spirit in the air tonight, and the bad spirit is trying to grab somebody and take them with him. As they spoke, I felt the vibe of the spirit try to snatch the little girl. Before our astonished eyes, she hopped out of her seat, jumped up in the air, and spun around. Like a ballerina spinning and spinning non-stop for several minutes. Her eyes were not her own, her hands were not her own, and her feet were not her own as they floated, not even touching the floor. Later that evening at the white table, Aunt Maria stood paralyzed without blinking or moving. Her features for over an hour, looking like a mannequin. Dressed all in black for a change, she stood. Trapped in a trance with a demon that was new to the occult but not new to her. I left the service even. More astonished about how the demon world worked, and I learned something new not only how powerful the spirits of the dark side could be, but also that they have no respect for age. The purity of 
That six-year-old was snatched away that night. She was now one of us, never to be an innocent child. Again. This was the life I lived for weeks on end, months on end, and years on end. After the service was over, often an adult would pull me aside and smile down at me. You're going to be something great in this religion, one might say, a look of admiration in their eyes. We can't wait to see how far you're going to go in Santeria, another would echo. You're going to be very powerful. You will win many souls. Even though I didn't understand these predictions at the time, I felt like I was a part of something that wanted me for once. I was part of something great. For the first time in my life, I enjoyed the acceptance and love I never got from my father. I looked forward to the next validation. The following.